Hey, investors, Todd here of TradingAnalysis.com and Inside Edge Capital. Look, a lot of bearishness out there, and uh, is it justified? Are we heading into a recession? I mean, there's a lot of bad news hitting the tape, scaring investors, right? We have the Fed just raise rates above 5%. For the first time since 07, we have regional banks collapsing, some being taken over by the Fed, some being bought up by JP Morgan. We have a looming debt default because the politicians can't agree on a budget. There's no surprise there. Are we going to default on our on our payments? Um, there's a lot of bearishness out there. And there was a recent JP Morgan study that shows 90% of the respondents uh, expect a recession in Q1 of 2020. Four. So what does that mean? Do you want to abandon stocks? Are the October lows going to be in danger? Well, in this video, guys, we're, I'm going to lay out three reasons why I think that we are in a new bull market, meaning those October 2022 lows are safe. I feel like we have some constructive developments happening below the scenes that are not being reported on that much because let's face it, fear sells. So let's unpack those three reasons, which are number one, earnings. Number two, let's look at what's actually happening in the regional banks and kind of look at some numbers. And number three, we'll look at two key sectors that are telling us an interesting uh, little bit of information about the state of the economy. So let's dive in. Uh, number one, let's look at earnings. Okay, we are reporting how Q1 of 2023 earnings did, right? We're, we're good. We're about more just about two thirds of the way through here. And so far earnings have been pretty good. Now, what I wanna focus on to start here is April is now the first month of Q2 of 23, and analysts are reducing the expectations for earnings for this quarter. And <clears throat> some may report on that and say, oh, that's not good. Uh, the you know, earnings are coming down, which is really what drives stock prices. But is there precedent for a reduction in expected earnings in the first month of that quarter? So what I'm saying here is this is April, month one of Q2, expected EPS, earnings per share for this quarter quarter have been reduced to $53.89 from $54.32. That's a 0.8% drop. Is there precedent? Yes. On average, over the last five years, okay, in the first month of a quarter, on average, over the last five years, analysts dropped their expected EPS by 1.9%. Over the last 10 years, they dropped at one8 over the last 15 years, 2.2, and over the last 20 years, 1.7%. So what does that mean? They're dropping their expected earnings, which is very common, by less than the average over the last 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. And by the way, this study is given to us by FactSet. John Butters over at FactSet does a really nice job. Free content's available on the website. Highly, highly recommend it. So really good job there. So the chart here is going to kind of put this into context and say, okay, this has been uh, the reduction in expected earnings for that quarter in the first month, all the way back to 2019. So obviously huge drop there in the COVID lows. And you can see just recently here, we had some pretty good earnings reductions, but guess what the trend is? It's been heading higher. So a good sign on the earnings front. Okay, <clears throat> speaking of earnings, Apple. Big, 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 big stock just reported a very interesting quarter. We'll talk about that here. Um, Apple right now out of the gate reported a dollar fifty-two earnings per share. Expectations were a dollar forty-three and revenues of ninety-four point eight billion. Expected ninety-two point six with gross margins moving up. iPhone revenue was very strong. What does that mean? Two things: consumer might be okay, and number two the supply chain might be easing, especially because they do so much business out of China, supply chain constraints might be easing. Technically, let's look at Apple. This is a chart that goes all the way back to 2019. Beautiful sort of consolidation here over the last two years. And if you can get through 170 here, which we are now through, the downtrend resistance has been broken. And on a technical basis, we so see no reason that Apple can't approach 200. So really good news there on the tech front. Okay, let's switch over to financials, okay? A lot has been said about the financials. 
Let's take a look at XLF. This is the ETF that represents the financials going all the way back to the COVID lows. So XLF is in green, S&P 500 purple, and the KRE, this is the, this is the major industry group in question causing so much drama and volatility. This is the regional bank ETF. So from the COVID lows, how have these three ETFs done? Well, the S&P is up 76% from COVID lows. XLF, financials up 70%. KRE only up 25%. And this big drop here is a lot of the headlines that you're reading about. What's the first thing you notice about this chart, guys? One, this thing overreacts on the upside and on the downside. Okay, look on the move up here coming out of COVID, massive outperformance in KRE regional banks above S&P and financials, and we're getting the same thing on the downside, okay? From a technical point of view, let's look at KRE, all right? And I'm throwing some pretty heavy technicals at you here. This is the KRE from the credit crisis lows. Look, simple uptrend line. We have some FIB uh, support right here. And that level comes in just at about $34. So the uptrend is still in play. And we've seen declines similar to this in regionals before. So is this the, uh, is this the death knell of, uh, of regionals? I don't think so. All right. So like, let's talk about this. I sent out a tweet uh, yesterday and I said, so many hair on fire bears out there because of this banking crisis. Regional bank market cap is what percent of financials? I said, I'll shoot a video. So just think about that. What's your guess? You look at the regional banks compared to all the investment banks and asset managers and insurance companies and the financials. What percent uh, uh, the, are the regional banks market cap of overall financials? And I did a study, and here's where it is. Okay, it's interesting. This is all of the financial uh, industry groups. Okay, all the financials. The total market cap of financials in the U.S. as of yesterday was four trillion dollars. The regional banks highlighted here is 340 billion. Huge numbers. Percentages help. Regionals are 8.36 percent of the financials. That's interesting. They're only 8% of the market cap of financials. Okay. And then further, think about this. Financials represent what percent of the S&P 500? Uh, it is right here, 12.45%. So you're telling me 8% of 12%, which is 1%. 1% of the S&P is causing so much chaos, right? And I get it. You know, I get it that if small regional banks are, are in serious trouble, it's going to uh, create a squeeze on lending for small businesses. But, you know, guys, I'm kind of a believer in the free market where, you know, there's a lot of well-capitalized financial institutions as well as non-financial institutions who can easily step into the lending game and create access to credit for small businesses. Now, the other thing I find that's interesting is look at this. There are 230 companies in the financial um, sector that I track. 90 of them are regional banks. So uh, more than a third of them are, uh, more than a third of the companies that are in the financials are regional banks, yet they're only 8% of the market cap. Maybe there's too many banks. And for comparison, in XLC, the communication ETF, there's only 25 companies. In healthcare, XLV, uh, which is like a 14%, 14.6% 14 14 uh, representation in the S&P. There's only 65 companies, right? So there's almost four times more companies in financials than there are in healthcare. So let's kind of put this in perspective. Okay, moving on. Let's take a look at consumer discretionary, okay? Now, they tell us that with rising interest rates, inflation coming into a recession, that we are in a uh, consumer environment where the, where the consumer is going to run out of fire, firepower. They're going to run out of ammo. And there's a few charts that I want to show you here that perhaps might shed uh, a little bit of light on this misconception. One stock, it's fun, gambling, DraftKings. 
Okay, look at this chart of DKNG, DraftKings. You guys have all heard of this, right? Stock surged Friday um, as markets digested positive Q1 reports. Ticker DNJ revenue, 769 million, higher than analyst estimates of 704, soaring past last year's uh, Q1 earnings of 417 million. So, okay, people are out gambling. Got it. Uh, Churchill Downs. Okay, this is a stock uh, that I own in our uh, tactical dividend portfolio in the wealth management. Look at this chart, Churchill Downs, with the Kentucky Derby coming up uh, here this weekend. Reports uh, record revenue ahead of the Derby. The Derby recorded uh, 595 $559 million in revenue in Q1, beating expectations. This was driven by horse racing. Uh, segment. Net income, $155 million over three years. Uh, last year's was $42 million. That's coming from Yahoo. Beautiful break out there in Churchill Downs. So they're gambling in DraftKings online. Maybe they're gambling online or right at, right at uh, Churchill Downs there uh, for the Kentucky Derby. And then I got one more for you. I know people are, I think, about to go camping again. Look at Yeti. This is a position we just put it on our stock swing desk. Uh, here's actually entries and stop loss that we put out there. Um, this is a chart that you know really got beat down post pandemic, uh, post COVID. But uh, this is in a technical and fundamental position. If we can break out through downtrend resistance, Yeti might be on a uh, tear here to come. So consumer discretionary from gambling, even some hotels, even some perhaps some camping looking solid. Let's flip flip it a little bit here. Let's go check out, we already used that one. Let's check out housing, okay? They say we're in a housing crisis because of high interest rates and high mortgage borrowing rates. Interesting, Toll Brothers, one of the largest home builders out there. Uh, just a little bit uh, shy of the all-time high of $75.61. This is in a very good technical position, and there's a lot of similarities in other home builders like Lennar, Beezer Homes we're watching, uh, Meritage Homes. I mean, there's a lot of good-looking charts here on the home builders, which, again, they're trying to uh, beat us over the head with housing crisis, yet the home builders are breaking out to new highs. Um, for me, guys, all of that, what we said, you know, the regional banks represent about 1% of the market cap of the S&P. Um, yes, in the near term, access to credit uh, for small businesses might be tough, um, but where there is in the free market a will, there will be a way and companies will come in to supply that demand. I find consumer discretionary stocks to be in pretty good shape. Um, I find home builders, some real estate, even some REITs uh, to be in fairly good shape. I find the earnings to be in solid uh, position here in Q1 of 23. Um, so I think some of the bearishness is not all that justified. So just watch out for those news headlines and uh, keep your eyes, your eyes wide open here as we uh, finish out the, the rest of Q2 as we're heading into the summer. It could, be, could get interesting. So hope that helps, guys. Look forward to seeing you on the next video update.